Okay, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. We are now entering into the final keynote speech and session. I have to say to you, this is well worth the wait. A uh, little announcement. The bags. We have been informed that we have now distributed all of our bags. If you are in possession of one of these iconic fashion statements, be proud because there are no more left. And the fact that there are no more left means that in 2016, this will be a vintage iconic <laughs> fashion statement. And for those of you who did not get one of our bags, I was told that there is a few remaining at the registration desk outside the door. So get your bag now and be that fashion victim you always wanted to be. <laughs> so, um, and no, no, you have to work a lot harder at this before you get the campaign jacket. <laughs> so now I'd like to welcome um, to the stage Ola Christensen, member of the European Parliament, and his presence here today is extremely timely. He is the rapporteur of the European Parliament report on the EU strategic framework 2014 to 2020. Now, Ola has been an, a member of European Parliament for Denmark for over 10 years. In addition to his commitments to all things pertaining to health and safety, he is also <coughs> involved in the European Parliament's work with the African, Caribbean and Pacific countries and also very engaged with the European Parliament's uh, relationship with Turkey. He has a degree in commerce among other things and he has had a very, very interesting career. At one point he was the mayor of Brovst, um, which is a city in Denmark. Now, what does uh, Ola do when he is not traveling back and forth between Denmark and Strasbourg and Brussels? What does he do in his spare time? Well, first of all, he tells me that he is now taking seriously his new position as the only Danish pelota player on the international scene. <laughs> And he is going to dedicate a lot of his time in future to training and to enter tournaments down here in Bilbao. Apart from that, he runs, cycles, walks, and guess what? Just like Krista, he reads books, but not online. He collects real books. And now he was explaining to me that they are building an extension onto their house so that he can get more bookshelves for his books. And I really quite like that. So, Ola. The stage is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. When I was uh, young, my father told me that if I should speak in a, a last audience, I should stand up, speak clear, and if I could start with a joke, it would be very good. But as you know, it's, it's very difficult to have a joke in a language which is not your original language. So I will not do that. But I will tell you that I hope that I'm a better politician than I'm a pilota player. <laughs> and I don't know because my, my hand hurts. <laughs> and now I think about if it can be covered by a work accident <laughs> or, or, or work-related diseases. I don't know, but I will think about that and discuss it with Krista in the, in the future. Of course, that's not so good for uh, Osher Institute to have uh, some work accident here at the conference, but no matter that. But I must say that I'm very pleased to be here today. It is a pleasure to be surrounded by so many people, both policymakers and experts who are interested in the issue of health and safety at work. 
I have been asked to say a few words on the future of occupational safety and health in Europe. It is quite a big question, as you know, and my conclusion should probably be seen as a mix of what I think is likely and what I hope will happen in the years to come. In general, I think that we have achieved many results in the last few decades. But with that being said, we have still a lot more to do if we want to live up to the expectations of the citizens of Europe. In the European Parliament, I have worked with occupational health and safety for many years, and I can say for sure that many Danes, some, but unfortunately not all of them who have voted for me, find this issue to be of the highest importance. Before I say more on what I think the future will and should hold, I would like to touch upon why I also believe that this issue is so important. First of all, as I imagine you all know, we have an internal market in Europe, which I generally think it's a very good thing. Good services and capital can be traded across borders and citizens of EU countries are free to move to other countries looking for education, work, and perhaps also starting up a family. This is indeed a good thing, and it has affected the lives in a positive way of many Europeans. But when we have an internal market, we also need to be sure that we have high standards across the European Union so that companies and governments are not competing against each other by lowering standards. This is also true in the field of health and safety, where we need a set of common and ambitious standards to make sure that the health and safety of workers is not jeopardized in a race to the bottom. Secondly, high standards on health and safety are important because we show the citizens of Europe in a very concrete way that they benefit from the membership of the European Union and that it improves their working lives. Every year, more than 4,000 workers die due to accidents at work, and the number, number of fatal work-related diseases amounts to more than 150,000 every single year. We also know for fact that more than 3 million workers are victims of a serious accident at work, leading to an absence from work of more than three days, also every year. That is, of course, not acceptable. And last but not least, reducing or removing basic rights to a healthy and safe environment is neither an unacceptable nor an effective way to increase productivity or comp competitiveness of European businesses. Actually, the result is quite the opposite in the longer run. The last point leads me to say a few words on the recurring issue of regulatory burdens and simplification of legislation. First of all, I think that debate on burdens and potential simplification can be a bit dogmatic and black and white from time to time. So let me start by saying that, of course, we should take the costs into account when we develop new policies, a policy that doesn't make a notable difference to the working lives of Europeans, but is very expensive for companies, probably isn't a very good one. On the other hand, and this point is crucial, we need to stop constantly and almost only talking about regulatory burdens and potential simplification of legislation. There may be room for consolidations within the existing regulatory framework, but simplification and reduction of cost for businesses is not and should never be the purpose of health and safety legislation. The purpose is to secure a high level of health and safety for all workers across Europe so that European citizens do not have to worry about being injured or falling ill when doing their job. Also, I think it is important to remember that ambitious 
policies in the field of occupational health and safety may very well increase the production cost of companies tomorrow, in a week, or in six months. But in the long run, we all benefit from these policies. Workers become more productive, which benefits themselves as well as businesses. We can improve the sustainability of national social security systems, and most importantly, we help out the thousands and thousands of workers who fall ill, are victims of serious accidents at work, or in the worst case, die every year in Europe because they go to work. A high level of health and safety at work is also needed if we want people to stay longer on the labor market and in the workforce. And in that way, it can also contribute reaching the EU 2020 goals. With this says, and to return to the theme of this speech from where I stand, the future of health and safety uh, of work should hold a more, not less ambitious approach. So where are we today? We have many different directives in the field of health and safety. The most important legal act is the European Framework Directive from 1989. In my view, it's established some of the important general principles, as for example, the responsibility of the employer, the basic rights for workers, risk assessment, and workplace health and safety representation. Since then, we have introduced many new directives, actually more than 20, which have brought about many benefits for workers, as for example, better protection from the risk related to exposure to asbestos at work, minimum health and safety requirements for the manual handling of goods, of loads, protecting of workers from the risk related to exposure to uh, carcinogens or motor games at work, the efforts that have been introduced since 1989 must be continued. We are never done regulating uh, on occupational health and safety. Some rules become obsolete as time passes, while new ones need to be introduced when we are witnessing the introduction of new types of jobs, new technologies, and so on. Yet, what we have seen in the last few years is a lack of new policy measures. I also believe that this tendency is reflected in the EU strategic framework on health and safety at work for the period 2014 to 20, which after some delay was finally adopted in June, June uh, last year. I do think that the framework does a fairly good job in pointing to the major challenges facing Europe when it comes to health and safety at work. New and emerging risk implementation and enforcement issues, importance of national strategies, better statistical data addressing the aging of the European workforce, and so on. But when it comes to concrete action and new legislative and non-legislative initiatives, I think the framework leaves much to be achieved. In my report on the EU strategic framework on health and safety at work, uh, 14 to 20, I have tried to come up with concrete proposals that I think is needed in order for the EU to play a positive role on occupational health and safety in the future. These proposals also reflect my view on what concrete measures is needed in the future. I must stress that the report has not yet been adopted uh, in plenary. It was, however, voted through Employment Committee with an overwhelming majority. And I think one of the reasons is that we have a very good cooperation between all the shadow uh, rapporteurs. And the major priorities in the report therefore reflects the position of a broad majority in the committee. Of course, there will uh, not be time to mention all the proposals in the report, but I will touch upon a few of them that I consider to be most important. If you are interested in seeing these and the rest of the proposals in writing, I know that the agency has been so kind as to make copies available to the participants. Work-related cancer is a huge problem in Europe 
and one of the cornerstone proposals in the report is therefore to update the directive on carcinogens and mutagens at work. More concretely, the Employment Committee recommends that the Commission present a proposal for the directive adding more binding occupational exposure limit values. That the Commission, in cooperation with the Adversary Committee on Safety and Health at Work, develop an assessment system that is based on clear and explicit criteria. The reason for this last proposal is that we need to be better prepared to take account on new risks identified in this field. Musculoskeletal disorders is an issue affecting millions of Europeans. At the same time, it is the main source of absenteeism in Europe. I therefore believe that we have many good reasons to adopt more ambition rules in this field. What we do in this report is to call upon the Commission to submit without delay a proposal for a comprehensive legal instrument on musculoskeletal disorders to improve effective prevention and address the causes of MSDs. Furthermore, we highlight the very important fact that consolidating EU and legislation laying down minimum requirements for protecting workers from exposure to economic risk factors can benefit both workers and employers by making the regulatory framework easier to implement and comply with. And the next one, I'm sure that you all uh, know that. Psychosocial risk, and in particular stress, is one of the main occupational health and safety issues facing us in the 21st century. At the same time, it is a very complicated question. Nevertheless, stress and other forms of psychosocial risk are structural problems linked to work organization. Preventing and managing psychosocial risk and work-related stress is therefore possible and necessary. In the report, we suggest the development of a program for systematic monitoring, managing and support for workers affected by psychosocial risk, including stress, depression and burnout, in order to draw up effective recommendation and guidelines to fight these risks. Asbestos and the related diseases are, I think, very, very scary issues. To name an example, in Denmark we are now seeing cases where the wives of workers who have been working in asbestos environments are becoming sick just from washing the clothes of their husbands. Unfortunately, asbestos is still present in Europe, and this issue has to be dealt with. Some of our suggestions in the committee are that the Commission should work closely with social partners and the member states to promote and coordinate member states' efforts to develop national action plans. That the Commission should design and implement a model for asbestos screening and registration. The only country in Europe who is uh, doing this is Poland at the moment, the only country. As I have already touched upon refit, it's quite a controversial issue, especially in the European Parliament. This is also true in relation to health and safety agenda. I think we are quite balanced on the matter as we welcome efforts, of course, to improve the quality of a regulatory framework and experts further progress in this field. At the same time, we also remind the Commission that the submission of us directives to refit and modifications of the legislation should be democratic and transparent, involve social partners and should under no circumstances result in reduction in occupational health and safety. Some of the other suggestions and issues we touch upon is the need of updating and providing a definition of work-related diseases better implementation of EU legislation in the member states, efforts in relation to the compliance of micro and small enterprises, and more involvement of social partners. Lastly, I also hope that the future of occupational health and safety in Europe will include a Bilbao agency, of course, that continues to be active, raise awareness, 
and provide policymakers and politicians such as myself with studies and extensive survey results. I have had a great cooperation with Krista and many others from the agency who have provided me with well-documented and balanced information, which is, of course, very important in the process of making policy recommendations. It is vital that we continue to base our future policies and ambitions in this field on knowledge and information about what is happening outside the walls of the European Parliament. And if we are to succeed in doing that, we need a strong and well-functioned agency. So with these few words, I'd like to say thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ola, thank you. And um, as Ola mentioned, there are some copies of the report, the draft report, available outside. And if you want to find it in your own language, we've just got some in English here, you can go on the European Parliament website and you'll find it there in your own language. And I believe it's due for adoption in plenary at the end of this month. <coughs> so now, to respond to the keynote, I am very happy to introduce to you, finally, someone from the European Commission. And uh, this person from the European Commission has been newly appointed as the Director for Employment and Social Legislation, Mr. Stefan Olsen. Now, the ink has not dried on his contract. He was appointed on the 1st of November, and I'm guessing this is his first trip in his new post. Am I right? So clearly he recognizes immediately what his priorities should be. <laughs> now, um, Mr. Olson is of course a long-standing um, uh, person working in the European Commission. He's a Swedish lawyer with degrees in international and taxation law. He's been with the Commission since 1996. He's been dealing with a variety of issues such as fundamental rights, social dialogue, anti-discrimination law, and Roma inclusion. So what does a Swedish European Commission veteran do to unwind and relax on his time off? Well, he runs, but no ordinary running. Mr. Olsen is a marathon runner. So over to you, please. <coughs> No, you just go ahead. And okay, thank you very much for that introduction and I'm very happy to be here. I should maybe um, just clarify the point on, on the nomination uh, in that the, it's, it's, it's a bit bigger than just about, uh, about me. Uh, DG Employment uh, is changing its organigram as of the 1st of November, so on Sunday. Um, and uh, it does a quite, it, it's quite a, a big change which reflects uh, the portfolio that President Juncker gave to Commissioner Thyssen um, in that she is responsible for employment, social affairs and mobility. Um, and uh, therefore, uh, there was already a proposal this spring to reflect that uh, portfolio in the organization of DG Employment. Uh, that was then delayed because of general changes in the Commission, but it has entered into force on the 1st of, of November. Um, so that uh, doesn't mean that much in terms of health and safety. Health and safety will still be together with the uh, labor law issues. Um, so, so that's a, a continuity there. Um, but what we have uh, will be for the first time that the structural funds will be mixed. So the European Social Fund, which many of you uh, know uh, and work with, will be mixed uh, together in the organization with policy. And I think that's a, a very interesting development uh, in that we should uh, improve the way we use those. Uh, it's 86 billion euros for the current programming period until 2020 to really advance policy issues and, and uh, not least health and safety. So we hope that this new organization uh, will be a, a kind of a catalyst for an increased improvement of EU funds 
uh, and uh, many of you play will play an important role because in the end it's it's national decisions uh, which are crucial in how we use this money. So, so just to make that point, and in that context then, I was, uh, I was uh, moved from uh, social affairs uh, to employment and to this area. Um, and I think that one of the reasons was that I've had a lot of uh, interesting work on this in the past, not least when I was personal advisor to the uh, Director General Odile Quintin during uh, many years, and we dealt with many of the uh, directives that Ola mentioned here uh, initially, such as scaffolding or vibrations, etc. So, so uh, that, that, that has, has a bit of a past that I think has put me here, and which also puts me here today. So I'm very happy to kind of start my new mandate with, with meeting all of you and, and, uh, and being in, in Bilbao. Just to... Um, many things, Ole has already said a, a lot of, of important things that I don't need to repeat about why we work on this, uh, the, the, the data behind, the productivity and the essence of health and safety for a well-functioning uh, internal market. So I think that's something that I personally and the Commission as an institution very much um, ascribes to. And it also, I think, reflects the very good cooperation that, that the Commission and the European Parliament has had over the years on this dossier. It has, it has been one of the more constructive uh, areas of work between the two institutions. Uh, and that's something that we very much want to continue with and, and, and that I'm very much looking forward personally to continue with. And, and more importantly, that Commissioner Thyssen who has 20 years behind her in the European Parliament, I know is very attached to. So, so that's, I think, is, is, a, is, a, is very promising. Um, the, you, you heard Commissioner Thyssen yesterday, so, so you know how much she attaches personally to this dossier and to the issue uh, of, of uh, psychosocial factors and work-related stress in particular. So I, don't, I shouldn't repeat that either. But I, I would like just to, to refer to, to first some of the policy dossiers uh, that we attach a great importance to and that we're working on. Um, Ole mentioned already, of course, the, the uh, strategic framework uh, and uh, for 1420 and uh, that this is a, a very important basis for our work. Um, we're very much welcoming the ongoing debate on that because that will be important, not least uh, for, for, it will be very important for implementation. It will be very important in the dialogue that we're going into now on modernization, on strengthening the framework, and also of course in order to develop the next framework because uh, that always starts uh, very early. So uh, we've got uh, opinions and conclusions from the Council, from the Economic and Social Committee, and now we're very much looking forward to this very good report that the European Parliament will adopt shortly. Again, uh, I don't want to make any comparisons, but I think that this, the work that the European Parliament has been do doing here as was described, is very operational and we appreciate that a lot because it really gives us a very good democratic input to our work, which we can take into account. Um, the issue of implementation, of course, is crucial for the, for the strategy to work. And, and we are, we're very, uh, find it very promising that we see that some member states are now uh, adapting their national strategies in line with the, the overall strategy. It's, that's something that we want to stimulate and follow uh, in, in, in the near future. Um, also, I think the, the, um, the issue, I mean, the, the role, the importance of the Bilbao, Bilbao Agency uh, is, is something that we, we can't under, you know, we can't overestimate. Um, because we see, for example, at this event and, and all the data, I was very impressed by the discussion earlier this morning, um, we see that the, the, the data gathering, the information campaigns, and the practical tools, such as uh, uh, the e-guides on, on psychosocial risks or the OIRA, and these are issues that really matter on the floor in practice, and, uh, and I can only, uh, I can only 
uh, underline the, the importance that the Commission continues to attach to the work of the agency in this field and in implementing the strategy in order to get those concrete results on the ground. Uh, and, and that's something that I don't think will lessen but rather increase in importance in the coming years. So I, I think that I could signal a very strong support from the European Commission of the agency here, and I will continue to do that, to do that in, in the future. Um, then coming, coming to legislation. As we've, uh, as we've seen, uh, and, and as the uh, SNR survey has, has once again underlined, legislation is the driver for, for, uh, for really introducing measures and uh, on at workplace level and 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 that that's clear and uh, that's something that that we need to continue to to uh, re to repeat because it's easy to take things for granted no and and uh, while we need to see that without legislation we will health and safety will not work i think that's that's very important to to state that um and here, the uh, ex post evaluation that we are currently doing, that will, under Article 18 of the Framework Directive, um, which will feed into the evaluation report, which, will, we, which we should produce early next year, um, is an important process in order to see what is this legislation actually producing on the ground. And that, that there is, because we have to see that it's not legislation for the sake of legislation, but it's a matter of getting real change across the 28 member states. And, and that is our main challenge, and that's how we should see the process which we will come into uh, from now on until, until uh, the end of next year. And here uh, you might have seen that the Commission uh, published its work program last week, and in this work program, we have the uh, health and safety as an important point with a, um, a proposal at the end of next year in improving, improving and simplifying the framework. And this might sound a bit bureaucratic, but for us who work in Brussels, um, we, what is very important is that this commission is very different from previous commissions uh, in that President Juncker made it very, very clear that he's only doing things that matter. And it puts a completely different new um, dimension to subsidiarity. It means that it's not, it, it's really, we should focus on a few important dossiers. So the work program, if you'd compare the work programs of this commission, they are a lot smaller than, than former work programs. And therefore, when you have issues uh, in the work program, when you have proposals in the work program and this str strong emphasis on health and safety, it really means something. And, and uh, also, uh, Vice President Timmermans is very personally attached to this area. So that means that we will act and, uh, and we, will, we will really have a very important process next year in order to get that action right. And again, that's why events such as this one today, the work of the agency, the work of the parliament is very important right now because all of that will feed into the joint reflection we will do in order to, to produce this proposal at the end of next year, which will then be followed by, by I think, updating uh, of a number of the other directives. We have also, as you know, in the pipeline of responding to, to, to one of the points in the report, we are, we are also uh, committed to uh, the update of the carcino carcinogens uh, directive as well. So, so that, that's also in there. But I, I just want to emphasize that this is not business as usual, which I think is also the, the, the name of the work program. Uh, this is one of the few key proposals that the, the European Commission is doing next year. So that really puts an emphasis on the importance of this area. And maybe just to, within brackets uh, to make a point which I thought was very interesting coming out of the uh, previous session. The Commission is also uh, looking and President Juncker is personally committed to a proposal on a new social pillar of rights. 
and uh, the colleague who raised the issue of, of uh, the nurses uh, here in Spain, um, and, and there were several other issues about the, the, the working relationship, and, and those are issues that, that we will also look at within this new social pillar initiative, and which obviously has a very important uh, correlation with health and safety, because if we can strengthen uh, and clarify the uh, employment relationship and strengthen the role and, and, and the implementation of overall labor law, including health and safety um, uh, under EU law, that can all, will, also very, will also be very important for the real implementation on the ground of health and safety directives. I'm not going to go into detail, that's rather, so if anybody wants to talk to me afterwards, I'm happy to explain that, that further. So, so um, I'll, uh, to, to, to close off, just to, to summarize, w the Commission, we see health and safety as a key part of the acquis. Um, the challenge we see and the challenge that Commissioner Thyssen sees is to make this really to, to increase the, the um, incidents, the, to increase the implementation for the workers on the ground today in Europe. I think that's a real, diff real challenge, and again, across the 28 member states, and in the light of the recession and all the, the problems that carried was, came out of that. So that's our challenge, and we will need to see how we can strengthen individual directives, how we can, how we can make the framework better, uh, simpler to apply, etc., so that we can get that change on the ground. Uh, and, and that's the challenge which I think we will jointly work on, on the in the 12 months to come. And here, I think the agency, again, will play a key role and uh, in order to, with all the data it has and all the expertise it has, to feed into that exercise. So before I, before I uh, uh, give the floor back to Brenda, just to, to uh, pay respect to the, uh, to the colleague, uh, Dr. Sebrial Gonzalez, who, to whom this, this conference has been uh, um, dedicated, and, and to, to just once again highlight his, his commitment, um, his enthusiastic work, uh, which was, as I understand, crucial for the work of the agency, but also for this whole policy issue and also recognize that we'll benefit from his work uh, in years to come. So thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you very much, Stefan Olsen. And now, Krista, would you like to respond to some of the, qu the questions raised? Uh, to both of you to get the f uh, positive feedback on the work of the agency. I think this is very much appreciated because that motivates us, all uh, agency staff, of course, but also our network, 28 uh, OSH networks in all member states. It's a motivation for the future because, uh, uh, of course, we are facing some challenges. Uh, many of you know, uh, uh, as for all agencies, we are facing some uh, cut in the in staff and uh, partly in also budget. That means we have reduced resources, uh, and I think uh, it is important for us to get this f uh, positive feedback because uh, sometimes uh, uh, when you work hard and get uh, get uh, uh, feedback, there should be further cut in resources. It's not really motivating. So. Uh, uh, I would uh, once again say thanks to, uh, to the network, to the 28 networks, to the focal point, to the social partner, to the government uh, who have supported that much uh, also the two years campaign. And of course, uh, as I said, uh, uh, the staff of the agency was very motivated and uh, therefore we had such a great success. Another issue I would like to uh, comment on is uh, um, 
how important for the agency, but I think the whole social policy depends on it, is the, the social dialogue. Um, uh, we wouldn't be that successful uh, if we wouldn't uh, base, if we uh, had the possibility to discuss all what we uh, plan, what we would like to implement, we, uh, we are able to di discuss this with the social partners. So the acceptance is very high and we hope also uh, when we get a new founding regulation, we find a way that uh, we have a close cooperation with all national social partners. That's key for us, but I think not only for the agency. Um, a third, uh, the second um, uh, comment I would like to do, because it was mentioned also by both of you, it's the EU OSH strategic framework. We are very happy um, uh, to contribute as, uh, uh, as EU OSHA to the, to the objectives and to the major goals of this strategic fra framework. And as we see, uh, we are mentioned quite often uh, in the objectives uh, uh, foreseen uh, and, uh, and uh, indicated in the, the strategic fra framework and we are already prepared to contribute via our multi-annual strategic program, via our uh, annual management plans and uh, uh, it's also linked to work-related cancer, it's linked to musculoskeletal disorders uh, which will be dealt also quite soon because the next campaign is dealing with an aging workforce or let's say safe and healthy workplaces at uh, any age and musculoskeletal disorder is one of the major risk and and causes of uh, early retirement and uh, long-term absences also we will go on in dealing with psychosocial risk that is uh, one of our key priorities and I think it's important also to see now um, uh, what was the out come the findings of the two years campaign and how we should proceed also together with the Commission uh, to see in which direction we should go, uh, where are the lags and uh, what can be done over the next uh, period. Um, we are also contributing, and that's together with the Commission, uh, contributing to a mapping exercise on national strategies because I think uh, there is a need to um, to have more, or let's see, uh, more uh, sustainable national, national strategies. We see at the moment, I think that was also linked to the late uh, launch of the EU strategic framework, uh, uh, that there is a delay of uh, the development of national strategies in the area of occupation, safety and health. And there we will try also to assist together with the Commission uh, to assist, to get a good picture and also by that way to, uh, to define uh, goals within the EU. That's from my side, uh, Brenda, and I think if we have time, we then could uh, take some questions from the audience. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Krista. <coughs> So, we have time for two or three quick questions. Now, when I say questions, I mean questions are a comment. I don't mean a speech. So, questions are comment, comments. Please. Aida. Thank you. Very quickly, uh, uh, one comment. Um, I have read the Commission's work program, and I'm very sorry to say, but health and safety is not put in a very high uh, level in the work program. So I think I have to contradict what you just explained to us, but just for you to know that uh, it's not a, a real uh, priority in the work program. And my question, my very quick question is, uh, Ole has just put forward some seven concrete proposals and measures to be taken. I was expecting what the Commission will do with them, also in a concrete and practical matter. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'll take one other question before I uh, come back to you for an answer. Yes, Caroli. Thank you very much, Caroli, from Hungary, workers. Uh, I was very happy to hear from Mr. Olson that 
his reading and understanding of the Commission's work program 2016 is so much positive for health and safety. I have to tell you, my very first reaction was like Ida's. Uh, reading through a week ago and be having been shocked. But if that's the reading, I, I would be subscribing to it and I would be just very happy if you can confirm that. Second, you didn't say a word about the Advisory Committee on Health and Safety at Work, but its role you foresee in the coming period uh, from your perspective, also throughout the evaluation, post, ex post evaluation process. And the third, uh, Tripartism, as you referred also, is the basic feature of this agency. Tripart tripartite management. We are very much concerned about the downsizing of tripartism, not in terms of numbers, but the consequences, what it might lead to, having just the one-size-fits-all approach from the Commission. I plead to you to take it really up in your new job and support us to maintain the tripartite functioning which has a real value and maybe Krista and uh, tomorrow in the board meeting we can also discuss about that. Thanks. Thank you for your questions. Um, would you like to respond Mr. Olson? Have uh, comments to make. Yes, I, I try on the work program. I think I, I tried to 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 make uh, because of course when you are in Brussels, you're seeing another reality. When you I was speaking to a Swedish minister the other day who was asking for a gender strategy, who for asking for an alcohol strategy. <laughs> I I've met a number of of uh, of other high-level uh, stakeholders who are, who, are, who are looking for several, uh, several new initiatives. And, and under a previous commission, um, this, this probably would have been in the work program. Uh, now it's not, because uh, President Juncker made very clear that he has 10 priorities and he just wants a very, very limited number of proposals. So I... I cannot enough emphasize that point that that having uh, clear initiatives on health and safety in there is an enormous success. It puts a lot of pressure uh, on, on me and, and the excellent colleagues uh, in, the, in the health and safety unit. But so I think there, there is a, this commission, and I'm sure uh, Ole can confirm that, this commission works in a completely different way, sometimes a bit frustrating for the colleagues in the European Parliament because we, we issue a lot less proposals, but the proposals that we issue, we take very, very seriously. Uh, and, and, and that's, so I, I, think the, I think I would try to, to, uh, to uh, be very honestly, uh, don't be disappointed, be, be, be uh, optimistic, uh, and, and then we just have to make sure that uh, uh, Jesus and, and, and the colleagues make it through to do all the things that, that, the, that Juncker has promised. Uh, but but that, that it is uh, together with, with everybody else. So I, I really believe in that. Tripartism and social dialogue, and, and thanks Krista for making the point. I started in the commission uh, in the social dialogue and in tripartism, and being Swedish as well, it's so natural to me that I, I forget to mention it in my interventions. Um, and it's so evident that, that the success in this area is based on this. Uh, and we're having very serious discussions within the Commission uh, of how to apply this in, in practice. Um, and, and also, there, there, there are a lot of discussions on costs, etc. But there, maybe I can add a, a, a you know, add a, a new, the reality in Brussels is very different because the member states made very clear that they were going to reduce the commission for the first time ever. And they were going to reduce the agencies and the commission for the first time ever. So it had been growing exponentially since, since 1958. And for the first time in history, as of last year, the commission is shrinking while we are growing in terms of member states. Um, and, and that, the Commission, only last week, uh, DG Employment lost 10 posts with excellent colleagues on them, 
to go and work on the refugee crisis. In the, in the, uh, in the previous times, this would have been additional posts, but now the priorities are like they are, and member, the member states have made very clear that this is how they want it. So that puts an enormous pressure on all of us in order to increase our commitment. So, and that's also something that I see as a manager in the commission, that every year I have less staff. And, and this is going to be re the reality. And it is not a matter of political priorities, it's a reality for all dossiers. Um, then, so I think I, I think I refer to, yes, on the issue of the replying to the report, I think we need to see that we need to respect a bit the institutional procedure. First, Ole needs to get it adopted in the plenary, uh, and then the, uh, and then we, we uh, need to have the commissioners and our commissioner looking very clearly at this proposal. So you're not going to get a, a mere director making comments on a report that's not finalized. But I think that I've tried to indicate some of the intentions, at least from, from what I see so far. But this is a very important process that we take very seriously, and we are very happy to have this report to react on. But we'll do it in time, so it's not for me today to, to do this, this full reflection. I think I replied to most. Otherwise, please come back. Ola, please go ahead. I'm an optimist of uh, nature. You saw that also yesterday evening. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, I hope that when Juncker talks about that he will do more on big things and less on small things, that big things are also uh, health and uh, safety issues. It is very important, and I don't think that we should wait on any countries. Perhaps we should focus on all the countries who are lacking behind very much. It is very important, or else we will continue competing on uh, bad uh, working conditions, and that's not good for Europe. I also think that we have to do with one of the things we are admired by almost all citizens of Europe, the health and safety of uh, workers. It's very good legislation. And I think that almost all countries need the backup of the citizens of uh, Europe. At the moment, we are in because it doesn't look good uh, across Europe. So here we have uh, a good way to focus on it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> and with that, I would like to bring this session to a close. I'd ask our, our panelists to stay on the stage and I will ask Krista to wrap up and say a few final words for us. So, uh, thank you very much, Brenda. Uh, so, here we are again. Uh, ladies and gentlemen and colleagues, uh, I think uh, after two days of really intense work and revelation, I hope you enjoyed the, this, these days and you, uh, you, can, uh, you had good uh, exchange of experience with colleagues and uh, you can take away uh, renewed uh, determination and also motivation uh, for your work uh, in your countries. So it's now abundantly clear to us that stress can hit any of us at any time, at any time over our working lives, regardless of age, sex, or status. But I think the good news is that the campaign has comprehensively shown that stress can be beaten. Perhaps the most valuable and uh, long-lasting aspect of the campaign has been to remove the fear of tackling stress and uh, uh, psychosocial risk. I believe we and uh, all of you have contributed towards a working environment in Europe. We're asking that fundamental question, what do you do to prevent stress and psychosocial risk is becoming ordinary and acceptable. This is good, uh, stress and its detrimental consequences have been hidden away for far too long. 
I really hope uh, that the old days are behind us and that we can shine a light on an issue that needs to be taken seriously. My hope for us now is that we recognize stress as something unacceptable and that we feel empowered to tackle it together. If we are confident and comfortable with recognizing the problem, then we can start to use the variety of uh, tools at your disposal to eliminate it. And if we are still not convinced by the moral arguments, the legal obligation and the human suffering, we must remind ourselves that work-related stress is expensive, far too expensive to ignore. And so standing still is not an option, as was said earlier, we need to act to get this problem under control and we need to act now. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to turn now to our forthcoming campaign, uh, Healthy uh, Workplaces for All Ages. And this campaign has yet to begin, but I do hope that we can uh, count on your support to make it as successful as the current campaign. As its title suggests, the next campaign will concentrate on developing sustainable working lives it will aim to raise awareness of the importance of good occupational safety and health management at any age and of tailoring work to individual abilities. We need your support uh, and that of all partners to ensure that the next campaign is successful and we really hope that you will take part. The campaign will be launched in April 2016 and we are uh, already well advanced in the preparations and I hope we will see you over the next two years as we now move to into a new exciting campaign. Dear guests, allow me a final moment to say uh, a big thank to you, the members of uh, EU OSHA's governing board and our national focal points without whom this global campaign would not be possible. I would like to ex extend a warm thank you to our official campaign partners, to our Good Practice Award winners, and to the members of the European Enterprise Network. Last but uh, by no means least, I'd like to thank the agency staff who have worked so hard on this campaign over the last years. So before I hand over to Brenda for some final uh, practical com uh, comments and information, please accept my heartfelt thanks to you for your presence and I wish you all a safe journey home. Eskeri Kasko, gracias, danke, merci, thank you very much. So thank you very much, Krista. We've come to the end of our conference. I really hope that you've enjoyed it and found it stimulating and that you've learned something. Um, <clears throat> I've been told that the headphones are fitted with tracker devices. So if you attempt to go out of the building, we will find you, we will track you down, we will hunt you down, we know where you live. Give them back. The second thing is we have in your, in your uh, folder, you have an evaluation questionnaire. It's very valuable to us. We organize these events every two years and we know we don't always get everything right. We get some things right, but your, your feedback is really of value to us. And in fact, I know our campaign manager, Heike, is already organizing a meeting for the staff uh, to feed back to us what you say about the conference. So it's, it's really great if you would take the time to fill them in. I'd like to thank the interpreters, the technicians, the management and staff of the Eus Calduna. I'd like to particularly thank again the family members and friends of Eusebio Real Gonzalez who came here and spent time with us. And I'd like to thank you for taking part in our commemoration. 
If you're not immediately rushing to the airport, please join us for a snack outside. And to all of you, have a safe journey home. See you soon again, and thank you.